Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Today, we're continuing our series of talks on the Teresa cycle and algebraic cycles. And we're very happy to have Valia Gazaki, who will be speaking about hyperliptic curves mapping to abelian surfaces and applications to Balenson's conjecture on zero cycles. And Valia, is it all right if we record this talk? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, great. And feel free to ask questions um, during the talk. Now, Valia, please go ahead. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah, yeah sounds good. Yeah. So this talk is not about the Teresa cycle. It's about zero cycles. Uh, I might mention, if I make it to my last slide, I might mention some potential future work related to Teresa type arguments, but uh, not for most of the talk. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Jonathan Lab, who is now at the University of Leiden. Uh, so we'll start with some background uh, on zero cycles. So throughout this talk, uh, X will be a smooth projective variety over an algebraically closed field. Uh, mainly for simplicity, the assumption k equals k bar, because many of the things I will discuss will become kind of simpler in this case. Um, and the goal for the talk is to discuss the structure of the Cho group of zero cycles um, in the special cases when k is the complex numbers or q bar or fp bar. The main potential goal is to focus on q bar, but the kind of the big uh, idea here is what is the comparison with the complex numbers instead? Uh, so the goal is to focus really on Q-bar and in particular on some fascinating conjectures over Q-bar. Uh, so just some reminders that uh, everything kind of starts with the Picard group of a curve. So if we have C, a smooth projective curve of genus G um, over K, uh, the Picard group is just the group of divisors, modulo rational equivalences, meaning divisors are, are divisors of functions. And as a reminder, if somebody gives us a rational function, then F induces a divisor by just counting the order of um, uh, zeros and poles. Uh, <clears throat> so since this talk will involve a lot of hyperelliptic curves, as a reminder, hyperelliptic curve is a curve that affine locally is given by an equation of the form y squared equals f of x, where f of x is a polynomial of degree at least five. Uh, and by looking at the equation, we see that every such hyperelliptic curve has an involution, sending x comma y to x comma minus y. And a fixed point of the involution is called the Weierstrass point. And we have a fundamental rational equivalence that for every point p in h, we have p plus p bar, where p bar is the involution, minus two Weierstrass points is zero in the Picard group of C. So I will come back to this potentially. This will be a key rational equivalence that I will use. And then uh, what do we know about the Picard group of C? We have the degree zero subgroup, which are just the linear combinations of points that uh, it's really like the kernel of the augmentation map. And this pick knot can be fully understood by the Jacobian of the curve. So oh, we can fix a, a rational point. We work over an algebraically closed field, so this always exists. Though, then for every fixed rational point, we can consider the embedding to the Jacobian that sends P0 to the zero element of, of the Jacobian. And this Yora P0 extends to a homomorphism from P0 of C to the Jacobian. And because I restricted the attention to the degree zero elements, this is independent of the choice of base point. And the famous abel jacobi theorem states that alpha C is an isomorphism. So for curves, pick not or pick C is just Z plus the Jacobian. So it, we have a very good understanding of it. So what I will do next is I want to extend this picture to higher dimensions. So, and when I say extend, I don't want to work with Picard group, but I want to work with points. So the Cho group that uh, we are interested in the two group of zero cycles. So now let's say X is a smooth projective variety over K equals K bar. A zero cycle uh, is just a, a formal sum of closed points. 
So really a linear combination of, of closed points. And the relations come similarly to what happened for curves. The main difference is now we take all of the curves inside the variety, all of the rational functions on them, all the divisors, and divide by that. So this is really a zero cycle is a rational equivalent, so rational equivalent to zero, if it can be written as a linear combination of divisors of rational functions on curves on X. In other words, Z is a rational equivalent if it is a linear combination of div FIs. For some FIs that might lie in different curves, and that's kind of the main difference here. And the Cho group of zero cycles is pre abelian group on all closed points, modular rational equivalences. And this group is the main... A question? Yes, yes. I'm trying to remember. So do, do, does it, is it important whether the CIs, are the CIs uh, are smooth or not, or whether... The, no, are, it's not important. We can take them to be anything because okay. the map will always factor through the, the through the normalization. So we could we could write down an analog of the definition only using smooth curves, but we, we shouldn't require them to be contained okay. in X. And we so, should just require them to have finite masses. And so then the divisor means it's a divisor on the normalization. And on the normalization. Forward, yes. And then you push it forward into the... Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. So okay. we could define yeah. that instead, yes. Exactly. And we see that when X is a curve, we recover the Picard group. So, so the main question is, uh, given a zero cycle Z on X, when it is zero or not? When is it a rational equivalence or not? And this is a really non-trivial question in higher dimensions. The main issue that is different than for the case of curves is that an element is zero if and only if is a sum of divisors. The, its divisor might lie in some in the function field of different curves inside X. The curves might not be connected to each other at all. And we cannot always write this as a single divisor. So that is the main thing that is different than it was before. And in general, it is very hard to describe explicit relations. And this, I hope, will become clear as we keep going. So what do we know about Chao Zero? Uh, generally, many things stay the same as they were for curves. So we do have a degree map, an augmentation map as we had before, since the class of a, a point to one. Um, and I will define F1 to be the kernel of the degree. So it is generated by classes X minus class Y, where X and Y are close points. And there exists a higher dimensional analog of the Abel Jacobi. It's called the Albanese map um, that goes from degree zero elements to this abelian variety. Albex is the dual to the pick to the pick knot. So this is a higher dimensional analog of the Jacobian. Uh, and the main kind of, if you haven't seen this before, the main the way I usually view this is that it is an abelian variety which is universal for morphisms from max to abelian varieties. Uh, we will see examples where this is zero. So it is very often zero. So it's really different than the case of curves. Um, but the main problem is that in higher dimensions, uh, the Abel Jacobi map is not always injective. It is surjective over K bar, but it is not always injective. And when I will define F2 to be the kernel of the Abel Jacobi. Um, so we get a filtration of Chao zero. So we have these two significant subgroups. The first quotient is just Z, easy. The second quotient is an abelian variety as easy as we could hope for. So really the complication is here to understand what happens with F2 and how large can it possibly be? So what about F2? So one of the reasons why it's, I chose to work over K bar for this talk is because over K bar, uh, a famous theorem of Reutemann states that F2 is always torsion free. This is no longer true over knowledge bracket closed fields. 
but it can really be non-trivial. And its structure depends heavily on the variety X, which we expect this is a geometric invariant. But the surprising fact is that it also depends on the nature of the base field K. And this is what I want to explore in this talk. So Mumford was the first one around 68 who constructed surfaces over C that has, have really large F2X. In particular, uh, F2 is not parametrized by the points of an algebraic variety. So we are really far away from what happened for curves here. The key points in the construction are first, the varieties, the surfaces have positive geometric genus. And here is the surprising fact about the nature of the base field is that C has many transcendental elements. So it's very transcendental over Q. More generally, a little later, Bloch generalized this to any uh, smooth projective variety over the complex numbers of dimension bigger than one. As long as the, the geometric genus is positive, F2 is really huge. So whatever happened in the examples before was not uh, was not a coincidence. On the other extreme, when K is the algebraic closure of P, Milne shows that F2 of X is zero unconditionally on the variety. So the slogan is that large field plus positive geometric genus implies large F2. And we really want to say that small field implies small F2. But we, of course, need to understand what by what we mean by, by small field. So the main question is, what about number fields? Any questions up to here? This is just an informal definition of large, right? I mean, you're, you're, I mean, they're not. Yes, exactly. I didn't specify, but by large, I mean at least, you know, two transcendental, two transcendent, transcendence degree at least two over Q. I think we'll already get something non-trivial. Um, so a lot, of, very transcendental, like Q P bar or even just Q P, already will give you very large F two X. But I've been kind of intentionally vague, especially the small field. So this is where the question becomes really interesting. What do we even mean by small? So, so in particular, what happens over Q bar? Q bar, the, set, the field of algebraic numbers, is countable, algebraic, but also of characteristic zero. And this is what makes it very interesting. So it, it is algebraic, so it is small in the sense that the way we cons people constructed non-trivial classes in F2 was using the transcendental nature of C. So this wouldn't apply here. At the same time, it's of characteristic zero. So the arguments that were used for FP bar won't apply here either. And the main point is that whenever you have a variety defined over Q bar, you can always base change to C, uh, where F2 becomes really large. So the famous conjecture here, due to Bellinson around the mid 80s, states that for X smooth projective over Q bar, F2 of X is zero, unconditionally on the geometric genus. So the expectation is similar to what happened over FP bar. But what evidence do we have for this? Pretty much only cares. So this is the case we knew before. So F2 doesn't even exist in that case. There are many examples that have PG equals zero. But for this, we even expect F2 to be trivial even over the complex number. So this is a conjecture of Bloch that predicts that PGX0 implies F2 is trivial, uh, even over C. And there are no known examples in dimension bigger than one 
that have positive geometric genus. And now we want to discuss two examples that really fit into this category that will highlight why the question is so hard and how can we try to quantify it a little bit. So the first example is K3 surfaces. So a K3 surface over K bar is a smooth projective surface that has two defining properties. First, has trivial canonical bundle. And this automatically imply that this PG is positive and has Albanese variety zero. And Albanese zero, oh, before that, I guess I have an example. So a famous example is the Fermat-Quartic. Um, surface in P3, x to the four plus y to the four plus z to the four plus w to the four equals zero. So let's uh, unravel what Bellinson says and wh what do we need in order to prove it. Albanese variety B is trivial means that the map from F1 to the Albanese is zero. F2 was defined to be the kernel of the Abel Jacobi. So it coincides with the degree zero subgroup. So F2 is this entire thing. It just takes classes X, my, my class X minus class Y. So it's generated by easy zero cycles of this form. This is at least nice that we have a very explicit set of generators. But if we want to prove Bellinson for a variety X over Q bar, this is equivalent to showing that any two Q bar points are rationally equivalent. The problem though is that Geometric genus being positive implies that this is very, very far from true for two general C points. Because we know that over C, F2 is really large. So whatever we do, we need to kind of use the fact, the special properties of Q bar in some essential manner. So a very uh, inspiring for us result in that direction is from Bovill and Voisin from 04, that for an arbitrary K3 surface over an arbitrary algebraically closed fit, any two points that lie on some possibly different rational curve inside X are rationally equivalent. In other words, if we have two morphisms from P1 to X with point X lining the image of the first map, a point Y lining the image of the second map, then the classes are the same. This is precisely the type of theorem we like, we would like to use for Bellinson because the rational curves could be in very many different places inside the variety, not necessarily connected to each other, but still they can safely say that if one point is on one curve and another point is on the other curve, then the classes are the same. So a wishful hope towards proving Bellinson is that maybe the Q-bar points of a K3 can be covered by rational curves. If this were true, definitely Bellinson would be true by this theorem here. And in fact, there is an old conjecture of Bogomolov from 81 that predicts this. But nowadays, most people don't really believe this and we don't believe it either. It, it, is, it does seem to be too strong, but still there are much more recent expectations by Bogomolov, Hazard and Schinkel that every K3 surface over an algebra closed field contains infinitely many rational curves, which at least will give a good number of cancellations. And this one is known for many classes over C and for some classes over Q bar. I will come back to these expectations later in the talk and how much of this we can weaken. Um, any questions up to here for K3s? Yeah, Jessica, you 
The next example is abelian surfaces. And this is the main one uh, I want to focus on. But always having the K3s in mind as a main motivation. So for an, for an abelian, so let's say A is an abelian surface over K bar with zero element zero. And any kind of early fact that we learn about abelian varieties is that they have positive geometric genus. So again, that means that over the complex numbers, this kernel of Abel Jacob is going to be enormous. And the second easy fact is that the Abel Jacobi map is very easy to write down. Uh, the Albanese variety is the universal variety for maps from A to it, so it is really A itself. And the map really does the obvious thing, sends a linear combination of classes to the corresponding linear combination of points inside the abelian variety. And by looking at this simple description, we can immediately compute generators of the kernel of the Abel Jacobi. So the kernel, this is what I denoted by F2, is generated by special zero cycles of the following form. There are these four term linear combinations, class of A plus B minus class of A minus class of B plus class of zero. I denote these by ZAB. So let's continue the same way we did for K3s. What would we need in order to prove Bellinson for abelian surfaces? Now that we have generators for F2, proving Bellinson amounts to showing that these ZABs are zero for all Q bar points A and B in A. But again, the problem is that this is very, very far from true for two general C points. And because of this, it's extremely hard to construct any examples. And that same is true for K3s, by the way. Before I move on to make this a little bit more explicit, in general, what is kind of the, the summary from everything we saw so far? To attack Bellinson's conjecture for a smooth projective variety over Q bar, we need first to find many curves inside X, and we want our curves to be kind of special. Uh, we want the curves to be defined over Q bar, and we want them to be special in the sense that we want them to produce many rational equivalences. So whatever special means, each class of varieties, class of varieties will have different special curves. But we also need to use very essentially the algebraicity of Q bar, because this is, is what distinguishes from C uh, and nobody really knows how to do this. So, in, regarding special curves, for K3 surfaces, the Beauville Wazan result suggests that maybe we should look at rational curves, and maybe these are enough. And one of the things I want to discuss in this talk is what is a good analog for abelian surfaces? Um, just as a comment that we shouldn't look for rational curves anymore because abelian surfaces don't contain any rational curves. Any morphism from P1 to an abelian surface will factor through the Jacobian of P1, which is trivial. Can I ask so a question I'll... about the, yes. Bo the Beauville Voisin res result? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you say, so rational curves are enough, that means that you can you can get the equivalence of any two Points. Maybe. I mean, again, but, but for in, that, you in, need the rational curves to cover the whole K3 surface. Uh, not necessarily. So that's a, no. so I will come back to this. But uh, how do you, but how, oh, but you, I mean, how do you, you, you have to use some other curves. If you have a, I mean, if you have two, if your two curve, if your two points are off of all the rational curves, you're going to have to use uh, one. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you really um, want to work with the K3 on the nose, you will really need to prove Bokomolo. But for example, what we will show is that for an abelian surface, we need much less than every point to be like that. And then we can push forward the information to some certain types of K3s. So we will need way less than that. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah. So you would need something more. Of course, there will be hidden curves there that we don't know exactly what they are. Mm -hmm. But the hope is that we won't need the entire book of Mon. We will need less. Uh, Okay. I hope I, I have enough slides to convince you a little bit about that we need less than this, but still we don't know. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So maybe to, to address Bjorn's comment, um, the... I would say maybe what really wants on right now, what it tells us is that definitely rational curves give us a lot of information. They give us plenty of rational equivalences. They could be enough, maybe not. Uh, but for now, the main question is what would be an analog for abelian surfaces? What type of special curves could we look for? And our idea is to look for hyperelliptic curves instead. So I will come back to this when I state the first theorem, which is coming in a, after a couple of slides. Before I state our first result, um, I want to discuss a little bit about this second part here of how could we possibly use the algebraicity of Q bar. And generally, this is where the problem becomes extremely hard. But here is something that we could do, for example, when we look, for example, for a product of two elliptic curves. Abelian surfaces in general have analogs, not just products of elliptic curves. But let's start with a product of two elliptic curves over Q bar. And let's unravel all the information. So the uh, we start with a group of degree zero elements. So if I fix zero, zero as my point as my the zero element of the uh, of v1 cross e2 then f1 is generated by classes p comma q minus zero zero where p is in e1 and q is in e2 f2 in general is generated by these zabs but in this case it actually has fewer generators so we can focus on special generators of the form p comma q minus p comma zero, minus zero q plus zero zero. And these are fewer than what I wrote down before because they are of the form z p comma zero and zero comma q. In fact, there is a surjection um, from e1 of q bar, tensor product with the two q bar, uh, sending p tensor q to this for linear combination zero cycle. That already here shows how hard the problem is. So the bad news. We want to show that this guy is trivial. We want to show this is zero over Q bar. It admits a surjection from something which is pretty large. So, so this guy is very large. In fact, if you want any two are defined over a number field, F, then this tensor product contains E1L tensor E2L for every finite extension of F. And by more way, E1L and E2L are uh, finitely generated abelian, the torsion piece doesn't matter, but the lattice piece is very essential and the ranks really become very large because we, we go up to the algebraic closure. So in order to prove Bellinson, we would need to kill the images of E1L cross E2L with EIL of increasingly large rank. But the good news of this story is that the fact that we even have this rejection implies that the zero cycle this is zp0 and 0 comma q is bilinear on p and q. And bilinearity is something that really gives us a lot of information. The takeaway, and I will make it more clear in the next slide, is that bilinearity plus more the way reduce the number of cancellations we need by a lot. So here is a weaker question. Um, suppose that we just start with two elliptic curves defined over q. 
And suppose they both have rank one. We take A to be the product. So I want to address the following much, much, much weaker question. What do we need in order to show that the ZABs are all zero for all A, B, Q points? This is very, very far from proving balancing, but it's kind of a first step, right? If I just want to kill all of the zero cycles that are defined over Q, what, what will I need? And here is a lemma. Suppose that we have points P in E1 of Q and Q in E2 of Q that are both of infinite order, then the claim is that if this zero cycle is trivial, the PQ minus P0 minus 0Q plus 0, 0, this implies that all the ZABs are trivial over Q. So just one cancellation gives us an entire lattice of cancellations. And I already discussed that um, it is enough to focus on these types of elements of Z A comma zero and zero comma B because these are enough to generate everything. So all we need to verify is that we can cancel all of these guys out. Let me prove this. This is an easy lemma I can prove during this talk. Suppose that I have A in E1Q and B in E2Q. Because the ranks are one, and somebody is giving us already a point P in E1 that has infinite order and a point Q in E2 that has infinite order, A and P are uh, zillinearly dependent, and the same is true for B and Q. So we can write down Z equivalences to zero. And then using the bilinearity, of the zero cycle, we can conclude that this zero cycle here is torsion, easy computation. And then we remember that we work over Q bar and Reutemann tells us that F2 is torsion free, so torsion implies zero. So the conclusion is that when both ranks are equal to one, we only need one relation to be able to show that Z of ZAB is zero for all Q points A and B. And when E1 and E2 are isogenous, this is very easy. But when they are not, this is very, very, very non-trivial. Any questions here? The main takeaway from this last couple of slides is that uh, motivate is the one thing we know that we could hope to use towards using the algebraicity of Q, of Q bar. Um, and we hope to take advantage of it. That's the main thing we have. We have motivate, finite generation, and we have bilinearity. So these two are essential pieces of information that we should be able to use somehow. Um, I, actually, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, maybe, maybe, maybe this is not, maybe this is not, not a, an easy, maybe this is not a short question to answer, but I was wondering if you look into the proof of Reutemann's theorem in this case, um, what curves do you end up using to prove that, that Z of the, that for the, that, that, that say say if you want to prove that z generator comma zero uh, comma zero comma generator is zero, given that you know that it's true when you have a multiple of the generators. So what what curves on e uh, one cross e two do you end know. up using? Yeah, I don't. I really don't I mean, know. It must be something explicit, I guess. But if you go into yeah, the yeah, I I really don't measures. know. I have to look at the at the paper. Okay. I, I okay. Yeah. I, okay. Don't. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I mean, all I can say is that for sure, Reutemann works over K, over K bar. It doesn't work over K. So generally, torsion could exist if we work over Q instead. And it does exist. We have examples of torsion, of torsion and non-trivial elements. So we could construct those um, over large enough number fields. So is, is the group F2 div known to be divisible? 
I mean, over Q, it shouldn't be. But over QP, yeah, over, for example, over algebraic mm -hmm. closed field. But over over algebraic closed, over over Q, over algebraic closed, yes. It's it, okay, so it's not torsion uh, yes, free, yes. but it's also divisible. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. So, so going towards the main results. Um, so definition, given an abelian surface um, a, and a point in A, we call X a hyperelliptic point if some non-zero multiple of X lies in the image of a morphism from a hyperelliptic curve to A, um, such that the hyperelliptic involution on H commutes with negation on A. This is a technical assumption that I will use uh, throughout well, in, in, whatever, in, in what follows. Um, so we are looking at morphisms from hyperellipticals to A that the hyperelliptic involution on H commutes with negation on A. And we look at the images inside A, but we also allow the points to be multiples of that, of such. So we don't want X to lie in the image of A on the nose. We allow it to be a multiple of something like that. So our first theorem, suppose A, comma B in A, and suppose that there exist non-zero integers, M, comma N, such that each of the points A, B, and M, A plus M, B is hyperelliptic, then the short version is that this ZAB is indeed trivial. But in fact, we can do a lot better than this. We can show that ZC, D is trivial for every C and D that lie in the divisible hull of the subgroup generated by A and B. I remind you the divisible hull is those points that have a multiple that lies in the subgroup generated by A and B. So having these three hyperelliptic gives us a whole kind of lattice of cancellations. And this is the theorem that we hope will take advantage of the Mordevay theorem. Some quick points, uh, the key points in the proof. Originally, we had a very complicated argument, but then we sent the paper to Boville and he simplified the proof for us. And then after he was following his suggestion, we simplified it even further and it came down to just two easy lemmas. The first idea is that we just push forward fundamental the fundamental rational equivalence on the hyperelliptic curves. So pushing forward the fundamental equivalence gives us cancellations of the form Z A comma minus A equals zero, if A is a hyperelliptic point. And then bilinearity. And this is uh, kind of the, the secret ingredient. So bilinearity gives us everything else. That the Z A B is bilinear on A B. And the main point I want to emphasize is that the points A, B, and the zillinear combination Na plus Mb are allowed to lie in the images of morphisms from three distinct hyperelliptic curves. Um, and that's why we like to think of this theorem as an analog of the boville voisin result for K3s. In some sense, if they all lie in the same hyperelliptic curve, this is probably obvious, but the point is that we allow them to be in, the, in different hyperelliptic curves with no relation between each other whatsoever. Let me go back to the question about the product of elliptic curves. For a product of elliptic curves, the situation is better because we saw that F2 is generated by this special zero cycles. And a very easy computation shows that actually P comma zero and zero comma Q are always hyperelliptic. So if we want to kill this zero cycle, all we need is NP comma MQ to be hyperelliptic for some N and M that are not zero. So going back to the question of, suppose I have rank one elliptic curves over Q, and I want to show that ZAB is trivial for all AB in A of Q, we, all that we need 
is to find one hyperelliptic curve mapping to A with a technical assumption on the involution and a point on the hyperelliptic whose image hits both coordinates uh, in a non-torsion way. So all we need is a point in H such that phi 1p and phi 2p are both infinite order. And then we can kill the entire model vague lattice. More generally, for a number field L, showing that all the ZABs are trivial for all AB in A of L, can be reduced to finding only finitely many hyperelliptic points in this lattice. And therefore, our theorem has the potential of taking advantage of the Moravec theorem, in particular of the algebraicity of Q-bar. So the conclusions so far is that uh, our theorem shows that hyperelliptic curves are special curves for abelian surfaces that produce easy rational equivalences. It has the advantage of taking care of, of taking advantage of the algebraicity of Q-bar. Now the main question is: Can we find any such curves, or is this an empty theory? So why hyperelliptic curves? Um, kind of a philosophical slide. So, so the goal is we want to find we want to find special curves that produce lots of rational equivalences. Uh, the first thing we could try is look for curves that have extra symmetries. And okay, hyperelliptic curves have extra symmetries. They have an involution with a quotient being P1. So that could be a good enough reason to look at them. And another kind of, the obvious thing to do is look what happens for small genus. So if we want to find small genus curves inside an abelian surface, well, we cannot find any genus zero curves. And then genus one curves might not even exist if I have a simple abelian surface. Even for a product of elliptic curves, I won't have that many of them. If I start with a product of non-isogenous elliptic curves, then every morphism from another elliptic curve to one cross two must be constant in one of the factors. So these guys will never produce enough relations. But also for the purposes of this talk, elliptic curves, I can easily view them as hyperelliptic if I want to. So the first interesting genus is genus two, and all of them are hyperelliptic. But the main reason why this is, we think this is a good idea is because we have a natural way to produce them. So um, there is a, a K3 surface associated to an abelian surface A. This is known as a, the Kummer surface. So we start with taking the quotient of A by the negation involution. And this is a singular K3 surface with 16 singularities corresponding to the 16 two torsion points of A. Uh, and we have a two to one map, the quotient map from A to X naught. Then we blow up the singularities, we get a smooth projective K3, and this is what is known as the Kummer surface associated to A. So the idea is that X or even X naught being a K3, uh, at least conjecturally should contain many rational curves. And when we put this back to A, this will be hyperelliptic. So the general expectation for K3s gives us that we should at least be able to find plenty of these curves. And this is exactly what we put forward. So our second theorem, says that suppose A, the abelian surface A, is isogenous to a product of two elliptic curves, then for infinitely many values of genus, at least two, there exist infinitely many pairwise non-isomorphic genus G hyperelliptic curves H, mapping by rational into A with a hyperelliptic involution on H commuting with negation on A. So, we do get that for isogenous to a product of elliptic curves, the hyperelliptic points are really plentiful. So we have plenty of curves and over Q bar, plenty of points. And just a comment that we really focused on proving that the curves we produce map by rational into their images 
because this is a condition that really guarantees that every new care we construct produces new rational equivalences. Um, there are ways that you can produce many hyperelliptic cares. And this was known already by Bogomolov, Hasset, Schinkel, that you can, as long as you can produce one curve, then you can tweak it by uh, multiplication by n maps on A. And that will produce infinitely many hyperelliptic curves. But for our purposes, these curves are all the same as the original because points and their multiples are indistinguishable for us. So this construction, although it does produce many for zero cycle applications, doesn't really give us any new information. So we needed a genuinely new construction that will produce also things in many different directions that will really give new cancellations for zero cycles. So in the remaining time, I will discuss the main ideas of the proof and some extensions. So, so the main idea is that we go to the quotient, the Kummer surface, and we give this a structure of an elliptic vibration. So we work over Q bar so we can put our elliptic curves into Leibniz form. Uh, and then the Kummer surface has an affine chart U of the form x1, x2, r, such that f of x1 r squared equals f of x2. And there is a, the, the rational 2 to 1 map from U1 cross U2 to U is x1, y1, comma x2, y2 to x1, x2, comma y1 over y2. And the key point is that when we look at this equation, now we have a cubic for x1 times r square equals a cubic for x2. And this becomes an elliptic curve over Q bar of R by taking 0, 0, 0,0 as the point at infinity. The Kummer surface has three different elliptic vibration structures, but only one of them is the interesting one for us. So it's the non-obvious one. There are two obvious ones, and there's the one called the Nose's pencil, this one where we take 0, 0 as the point at infinity. Um, so yeah, formally, this is um, in Oz's pencil, an elliptic vibration. And the great news is that it has a very large motivate group. So the motivate group of this elliptic vibration has rank at least four. And then every zillinear combination of the four generators gives a section um, P1 to X, which pulls back to hyperelliptic in the abelian surface. Um, this process produces hyperelliptics of larger and larger genus. But the good news is that these are all defined over the base field. So if uh, you want it to are defined over a number field F, then all of this process is defined over the number field. I guess the only thing we need is we need a fully rational two torsion for all of this to work. Now this produces plenty of curves, but the genus just becomes really high. And then if we want to start seeing repetition of the genus, what we do is we repeat the process for any isogenous pair, E1 prime times E2 prime. So over Q bar now, we see a lot of repetition of the genus. We get plenty of such pairs. Um, we really, really Jonathan, really did a very hands-on computation of the genus. Uh, we got some bounds for the genus. Uh, we do expect heuristically that all the genera congruent to two modulo four should appear infinitely often. Definitely we can see this for genus two, genus six, genus 10. And the main point is that the elliptic vibration is very explicit. So we can, the curves we produce are very explicit. We can find Weistrass equations and we can compute the morphisms through one cross it two. Here is an example. So here is a genus two curve. The genus six is too large to fit in the slide. So I didn't even try. Um, and to finish up, uh, I wanna go back to the question of how often can we show that at least the Q, the, the, the zero cycle defined over Q are trivial. So we did a computation in a former paper 
where we only knew a few curves. We didn't have the elliptic vibration structure yet, uh, or we didn't know about it. So we, we took examples from LMFTP, from rank one, non isogenous rank one, rank one, and up to rank three times rank three. And we got plenty of cancellations, but just by using six hyperelliptic curves over Q of genus two. Now, using higher genus and small degree isogenous, we can actually do a lot better. Um, so, I want to stop here. I have another slide with some future directions. Do I have time or should I stop? What, um... uh, yeah, you have time. So the main dire one direction that I really we really want to explore also with graduate students is we need more computational experimentation. Um, we want to use, so, so I guess I would go back here and I would say that Jonathan I, I, and I met over the summer and he showed me, we even found examples of hyperelliptic curves of like 0, 064 or something that have points. So it was very impressive that because we have infinitely many curves and we only need finitely many of them to have points. We do get them, and even in very high genus, we do find points, which is extraordinary to me. Like we've had like really high genus, and we could still find some points. But we really want to do more ex more experimentation uh, with magma. Um, in particular, what we want to do is we want to use hyperelliptic points living in higher degree extensions. And we really want to take advantage of recent breakthroughs on the density uh, of degree D points on curves. This work of Isabel Vaught and Bianca Virai really gives us a lot of ideas of how we can take advantage of plentiful of points in these hyperelliptic curves. Um, another direction that I want to explore with a graduate student is I want to, we want to find special curves and analogs of these theorems for a product of an elliptic curve and a genus 2 curve, and even an analog of the boville boisson for the quotient surface module of the diagonal action of the involution. I have certain guesses of what special curves could be here, but we haven't done anything like that yet. This is something that we discussed a little bit with Padma, is now that we can produce all of these interesting curves on a product of two elliptic curves, we should be able to construct interesting one cycles, um, cohomologically trivial, a la Ceresa, on a triple product of three elliptic curves. So this is something that I really want to explore. And since this is a Ceresa cycle seminar, I should mention this. We haven't done anything yet, but we have some ideas. And this is something that actually we have started doing with Jonathan already. So in a completely new direction, we want to go towards the Bass, Bloch, and Bellinson conjectures that um, predict that if we look at um, a smooth model of the product of elliptic curves over uh, some ring of integers, some, some uh, spec Z1 over N, then this kernel is expected to be torsion. This is originally due to Bass, and then later it was related to the bloch bellinson conjectures. And for this, there are some old results that uh, construct so-called indecomposable cycles. And we really want to do this for non-isogenous C1 and E2, and we have made some preliminary progress on this. And this hyperelliptic curves really come in handy. The fact that we have all these curves help us produce cycles. So. I'm, on, I'm not going to say more. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valia. That was a wonderful talk. So let's open up the floor to questions. Maybe I can start with one. Uh, have you thought at all about replacing hyperelliptic curves with double covers of curves that are double covers of an arbitrary curve? Like, so do you think you're getting the most mileage from having that involution or from having the quotient be the projective line? Yeah, I don't know. The The main one thing that we definitely know is that, for example, trigonal curves won't do the job because um, 
I think it all, even over C, you can cover everything by trigonal and hyperlytic, but over C, we don't get enough cancellations. For example, for the product of an elliptic curve and a genus two curve, my expectation is that probably hyperelliptics we won't be able to find that many, but maybe something of what you're saying, what we are thinking, or maybe, maybe uh, by elliptic curves in that case, for example. So it could be things that have like involution, but the quotient is an elliptic curve instead. This is my guess for the cross C case that we should be able to find easy rational equivalences using the by elliptic curves. Um, I think Jonathan in his thesis did use something more general like this, but we haven't explored it enough. Oh, great, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I'm curious what you can say, if anything, about the Gs that are not two mod four. What do you have an expectation? What do we know? So, uh, so the, the way we computed the genus, it seems to come in arithmetic progressions, but sometimes when we get some, um, we, we do get the genus to go lower because of some singularity conditions. So we have found some examples like some genus five curves, uh, but these are kind of special. These only happen when this construction gives us singular curves. Um, so we don't know if there will be infinitely many or if we can see all of the genus appears. Um, the, of course they could exist for other purposes, but this elliptic, this no pencil, it seems to mainly produce things that come in two mod four or generically, I would say generically they come as genus congruent to two mod four, unless if there's some reason for the genus to go down. Are there any G for which you know there are not infinitely many? I mean, we only have heuristics really because all we could do, I guess what we what we could do is we could show that the genus, uh, so if I start with a given linear combination of the Mordevay lattice for the elliptic vibration, uh, we can put the, the genus on a certain closed, we can find a lower bound and an upper bound based on the height of the Mordevay element. And we do just expect that the upper bound is always, is most of the times achieved. And these are the, the congruent to two modulo force. Uh, but theoretically, we and we do get some examples where the genus goes lower. But other than that, I don't know if I can say anything more than this. Um, do you know yeah. any examples for G equals three? Yeah, for G equals three, I don't think we have anything. I think, I remember we found a G equals five. This is the, the smallest, which is not two that I remember. Um, but, but also I'm not the right person to ask. I think Jonathan is the computational of the two of us. So he is, keeps doing the computations probably as we speak. So he might have a better answer for you. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Wonderful talk.